Hello everyone, I'm Katie in Chambers and welcome to another BTS Live episode. We are still talking about loss and grief and today I am speaking to one of my bestest friends, my sister from another mother, that's how they say it, right? And uh, I have been looking forward to this particular conversation. Maxine McTaggart is who is in the guest chair today. And she has some stories to share with us about how she has been coping with her most recent loss. She's also going to be sharing with us how she has coped over the years with the other losses that she has experienced. We are continuing to shed light on loss and grief because as I've been saying since we started the series, 2021 and 2020 have been two years like no other. And so many persons are going through it as it relates to loss and grief. And so we are diving in to be able to share with you what has been helping us and what our experience has been to see if it can help you if you are grieving or to help you help someone else who might be grieving. Maxine, welcome. Thank you so very much. Good morning to you and your guests. Good morning, good evening, good night, because we're not sure when you're going to be exactly. talking. Exactly. Good afternoon, want, wherever they are. <laughs> I want to, to quickly highlight that Maxine is a trained counselor. So she's in the media industry. That's my background as well. And um, she's also a trained counselor. And so I, I'm prefacing our conversation with that bit of information because sometimes it's helpful because I highlighted that though I am a psychologist, I've still, I still had a challenging time in some instances dealing with losing my mom. And so I've shared that because I want you, you, you to understand, you, my viewer, to understand that it doesn't ma matter how you are dealing with it for you to be gentle with yourself because it's not an easy thing to deal with loss and grief. So we want to hear you now from the counselor's perspective how it has been for her as well and any life lessons that she's learned. Right, Maxine? That's correct. <laughs> All right. So... I started by saying that your, your most recent loss, you lost your mom. That's correct. When, when did you lose your mom again? Um, that was last year, December 16th. Yeah. So just, we, just, just, yeah. just got to the year's yeah. mark. Two and weeks ago, it was one year, you know, yeah. since it, um, And I want ahead. to start by saying that it was funny that on the 16th of December this year, I came across this quote. And to be honest, no, I don't remember where I came across it, but I'd written it down. And it says, grief never ends, but it changes. It is a passage, not a place to stay. Yes. And I think that's what I want to um, also focus mm -hmm. on today that, you know, sometimes people want to tell you, oh, it's enough time. And, you know, but the truth is, Grief, once you have loved, once you have lost, grief never ends. However, however, um, as it relates to being healthy for yourself and also for others, you know, don't let or try not to let the griefing still be the same place where it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. you know, That's what I said the last the last episode, Maxine. Where if it's years later and you still feel like it is day one for you, that yes. is when you really need to look at getting professional help. Definitely, definitely. Thank okay. you so much for to allow us to start with that quote. That 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 quote. It is really, really profound and uh -huh. spot on because I, we're now at what May, so April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. Eight months. Yeah. Since I've lost my mom. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't feel today like it did. <laughs> Definitely right. not day one or month two, you know. Mm -hmm. But I still have moments where I'm teary eyed, I'm crying or yeah. whatever. Um, but the truth is, I can see that I have progressed. And I have accepted that 
the feeling of grief and the sadness that I feel is never going to completely, to be completely gone. But it has been transforming into something else. And I have longer and longer stretches in between the feeling down, you know, um, where I can feel um, and be present and enjoy things that are happening. So as you say, if you're yeah. still feeling the same way years later, then That's yes, it's time to get really do, You really need to do a check. Um, as it relates to my mother and my grieving process, um, as you mentioned that I am a trained counselor and I have had several losses. I've had my father, I have had my brother, i had a very best friend um, that was 2005, my brother was 2003, and then there was my father in 2014, and then there was my aunt 2019, mm -hmm. and my mother 2020. My aunt and my mother died a year apart, and those were my two mothers. I had a picture up on my DP the other day where I was in a photograph smack in between both of them. And every time I had a picture, I said, who would have thought that I would have lost these two persons a year apart, you know? But um, my training has helped me to be able to deal with the losses of these persons. One of the things that I do in order to cope is when the memories come, I don't shut them out. I allow mm. them to flow. I allow the body to go through the experience because one of the things I do believe is that life is filled with lessons. There are some lessons that we are to learn. I strongly believe that if you fail those lessons, you are gonna have to do them again. Again and again and again and until you it, get it. Exactly. Yes. If you are in if you are if you are in university or wherever it is. And you need to pass a course in order to graduate or to get your, your to be certified. You have to pass a particular course. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that grieving also is that, that thing. You need to pass a stage in order to get to the other level. And so for me, I allow the memories to, to flow, you know, um, with my mother. I... She was she she died on the 16th of December, but it's not every month that I remembered that she passed on the 16th. So I wasn't keeping a track to say, all oh, right, today was one month, two months, three months. However, I must tell you that when it came down to um, edging to the year, yeah. I start having some experiences. I had to go to the doctor to do a blood test. And when I went, I remember the doctor was saying to me, hmm, you were here a year ago. And I remember I'd taken my mother there. I was doing my own blood test. And as I sat in the place, I was like, a year ago, I had my mother right here. And so I was going through a process. So as I said, I was fine coming on to the year. But then I started, remember, on the 28th of January um, of November, this was the last night my mother slept in her bed. And for me, I wasn't working with dates. I was working with days. So the Saturday night, I was like, this was the last night my mother slept in her bed. The Sunday morning, I was like, this was the morning that I had to rush my mother to the hospital. And then as, they, as the, week, the two weeks progresses, I was just remembering things. I was remembering what may happen on a particular day that I went to the hospital. I remembered um, the Monday that I went and, you know, because her temperature had spiked, she had a rag, they placed a rag to bring down the temperature. And I was just remembering those stuff. Just, just The remember. question, how did those memories make you feel? Was it, did you feel sad? Did you cry? I uh, know I didn't cry and um, and I wouldn't even say I felt sad. I just know that I had the memories. So it's not that I was sad and it wasn't that I cried, but I was reliving these days, you know. Um, for me, uh, as it relates to death and dying, I am a firm believer that only God knows when persons are going to 
go. And so I don't beat up myself to say, boy, this person shouldn't have gone as yet. That is one of my way of grieving. Yeah, because so many times when we lose our loved ones, all we keep saying is, you know, it, they, it, they, they left us prematurely or gone oh, too soon right. and, and versions of that. And as I process that, if that is how we view it, like the person is gone too soon, mm-hmm. I feel like it makes the pain worse because it feels like you have been robbed of something versus yeah. if you can um, reframe the loss in a way where like for me what I choose to do is to focus on the fact that my mom lived her life to the fullest to the fullest instead of saying she was only 60 and I was robbed of her getting to 100 with me being 80 kind of thing you know (laughs) (laughs) because I had those great plans you know to simply say that she lived and extracted everything out of the 60 years and that is what I choose to focus on and when I do that it gives me some kind of solace. Exactly. My heart hurts a little less because mm-hmm. I'm not focusing on, oh my God, I got so little time. So, you know, I ask because I know that's one of the things that many people who experience a loss um, go through feeling like I've been robbed. And mm-hmm. once, if you stay at that space, in that place, the grieving process is going to be more painful and it's going to take so much longer to get to the other side. Exactly, exactly. So I I had to do, you know, my mother lived her life to the fullest. I, 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 I was saying to somebody the other day that, you know, if I didn't believe that, that only God knows when he's gonna take us from this earth, I would blame the hospital to say that they didn't give her enough support. Mm-hmm. They didn't talk her enough. If I was one to hold on that she's gone too soon. But mm-hmm. I, and so not everybody grieve like this, but this is the way I grieve. Um, for me, I prefer, I, I choose death over suffering. Oh, definitely. But let me ask you. So, so you you lost your brother mm-hmm. and and uh, viewer, let me tell you, Maxine and her family are close. So you lost your brother. Mm-hmm. You lost that best friend. So I met Maxine shortly after she lost that friend. So I'm the best friend now, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody else who is, anyways, <laughs> she has lost a best friend, but I know I'm special, like we all are. But anyways, she lost a best friend. Um, she lost her, her dad. Um, I was there for that as well, and she lost her mom. So my question, Maxine, you and your aunt, who mm-hmm. was super close to you as well, as oh. you said, your other mother. Um, mm-hmm. My question is, that's losing five people who you were extremely close with, who you mm-hmm. loved more than anything. And did the grief, or does the grief look the same for each loss mm-hmm. that you've had? Definitely not. And I must say also that I lost I lost my grandmother in 2007. Right. And she also was the best grandma ever. Um, no, not one of those grief look like the same. My brother, my brother's death was sudden. I spent the end. In fact, in fact, my grandfather died the day before my brother. <laughs> So that was a year, a day apart. Mm-hmm. And God would have had it that I had spent the entire day with my brother. And we were planning to, to go. And my mother was in West Milan at the time with her father. And so when we got the news on the Friday that he died, you know, we said, okay, Sunday morning, we're going to go and get mommy. We don't want her to take the bus up. And so on the Saturday, I spent the entire day with my brother. And when I got home, got ready for bed, my sister-in-law called and she was crying. And she was saying that something is wrong with Dane. She said, he's not breathing. And I'm like, what do you mean by he's not breathing? Because when people are not breathing, they're dead. But that cannot be what she's trying to say. Um, I found out because um, 
I found, I, I would talk about it a lot. So that is one of my ways also of dealing with the grief. So if, if I catch somebody who is willing to listen, I would tell them that. Um, from because my brother died in a November on a November as well. I would have told him that, you know, my brother all week long was calling to wish me happy birthday, and I was telling him to be patient because my birthday is not because he died like three days after my birthday. So I I I was just telling persons the whole process, and so that was what was helping me. I didn't know at the time that that was my way of dealing with it. Yeah. And like I said, I do hold the belief that no one dies before their time and that bath in the memories so there was that for my brother but then again there was my friend two years later i, I, I mean not only just two years i remember when i i visited her in the november um because that was the year after my one year since my brother had died and i went to for thanksgiving so i visited her in the november and I got a call in the January that my friend died. I'm like, what? And so I wasn't able to shake her death, even though I do believe that people, um, persons don't die before their time. But it so happened that while I was doing my degree in counseling, we had a class, grief and loss. Yeah. And it was in that class that I realized why I was so... I'm going to use the word hung up on my, why I couldn't shake my, my friend's death. And it was from that class, the lecturer told us that sometimes we grieve for the person who the, our loved one has left behind. And I was like, it, it, the, the light came on because my friend has had such a rough time and she fought her way and she, she, she was just, things was just happening for her. She has just bought a house and things was just looking up. And she had a daughter, a daughter. Who, she was a single mom. Yes. How old and, was and that? Was um, um, her daughter at the time now? She was eight. Eight, right. And then to understand also some family issues that they yeah. had, she may not necessarily have wanted them to, 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 to be the one taking care of her daughter. Mm -hmm. So that was where I struggled with the most. But once the lecturer allowed me to see that, I had to make, um, I had to make peace with it. And, and I'm gonna share a quote that you sent to me as we prepared for this episode mm -hmm. of BTS Live, where you said that we grieve for the people that the loved ones have left behind. So, so that is one of the, so that, that level of grief that you were feeling was because Zandria That's has right. left her daughter. And That's so right. your worry and the pain that you were feeling was about her daughter that was oh. left. And I get that. So sometimes that is how it is. Mm -hmm. And there is another version of why we grieve and how we grieve that I've embraced now. Uh -huh. And that is that grief is the unexpressed love that we have for our loved ones after they have departed. So we have it and it is just, we don't have any, we don't know what to do with it. Exactly. And this is why until we find ways of doing um, something with it, it, mm -hmm. it hurts so much more. So this um, BTS Live loss and grief series is definitely um one of the 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 the, the things that i use as my yeah. strategy of coping with my loss of my mom and my grief process it's just one of the many things that you say talking helped you deal with losing your brother and the, the reality is that each of us as we experience grief will have to find out what works best for us why does the grief feel as heavy as it does if it does mm -hmm. and understanding the why too is also what helps us to identify what do we need to do to help ease us through the experience and through the process as Maxine so aptly described a while ago as a passage not a destination as a passage right 
So, uh, you know, I like when, because as we're talking, what we're bringing out, Maxine, are the strategies mm -hmm. that we, we have been using and that you have used, you know, right. as well as, um, so the strategies are one, but also the inside. Because what I find is that sometimes we are doing something or we're experiencing something and we don't have the right words. We don't realize because so much of what we do sometimes is done from a subconscious level. That's correct. But, shine it, but being able to see it for what it is, giving us that clarity helps us to either extract what we should, the lesson sometimes if it's a lesson, mm -hmm. or getting yeah. that, this, that, that insight that we can actually move forward, which is why we're sharing all of these. So I am, this is all about you viewers, whether it is that you are grieving a loss or you are trying to offer support to somebody else who has experienced a loss. And I want to profess it again um, by reminding you that loss and grief is not only about the death of loved ones. No, you experience no. loss and you experience grief if you lose your career, if a relationship, that was a significant one for you ends you because it's not just romantic ones you know when we have our best friends our friends who have been important to us or let's say a cousin or a relative and the relationship deteriorates and just fizzles dies we grieve Definitely. as well you know for people who are experiencing ill health the grief that we feel and the loss at having our health compromised it is, it is significant. And so we want to remind you that this series on loss and grief also is useful to you if you are experiencing other forms of loss as well. That's right. All right, Max. So you talked about what it was like when you lost your brother and dealing with that grief and then your, your best friend, Zandria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was it like when you lost your dad? And I want to say Maxine's dad had Alzheimer's before so listen and I was I was I was there for that what was it like though losing your dad and how did you cope um before I even touch that I want to add to what you said about loss is not only death I remember when I started that course the same grief and loss one of the things the lecturer the first thing her opening line to us was listen sometimes person have a coconut tree dies sometimes a pet, Yes. There's things that, you know, we tend to think that grieving is only about death, but it is not. It is not losing anything that is significant. Anything to you. that is significant, anything that you hold there. And so a lot of persons don't think that they can, can, can be grieving because they lost a pet or they lo lost a plant, you know? And so, as you said, this session here that we are doing is to help persons to realize that you may be grieving and don't even know because it was not the loss of a person and that it is okay to grieve these things, you know? Um, let me jump now to, to, to what you asked about my father. Ah, my daddy. My yeah. daddy. Ferdinand. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, Ferdinand. I, we, we were, and every time I think about it, my father's name was Ferdinand. And so... Um, I think about King Ferdinand. And so we, my sister and I, we were his princesses, you know, and like, hmm, I'm royalty, you know. Um, my, I, I grieve for my father long before his physical death. So my grieving process where that was concerned was just completely different to the point that when he actually took his last breath, um, it was, I was happy, I was relieved that his suffering was over because I experienced my father um, losing his memory. I, I went through him, we had to go through the house and we had to put, we had to tape up all the mirrors because he was seeing the next person in the, in the mirror and he thought it was a gentleman who was working because my father was a, was a builder. And so, you know, there are times when he would have gone on construction sites for two weeks and all of that in a different parish. And so he would have seen the person, I remember, once. His reflection. Um, so he was seeing his reflection right. in the mirror, but couldn't right. recognize, didn't somebody. recognize himself. He thought exactly. it was somebody else. Mm -hmm. right. But when, when I, when I, when I remember one day he looked at my mother and said, you know, you're a pretty lady. 
And yes. my mother, you know that I'm your wife. And he said, don't bother with that foolishness. Because not even that, he, he, he could recognize, he couldn't recognize that I was his daughter. I've seen my father move to the point where his speech went. He was in pain and he couldn't tell what was happening. He couldn't, he had gone to a point where he couldn't even eat the food, you know, so. So you experienced grieving for him while he was physically still here. Yes. He had lost autonomy. He had lost his memory. So all of the things that identified him and his personality as your dad and yeah. as your, your mother's husband and as Ferdinand, all of those things were gone. Were that gone. must have been difficult. And I can't even imagine. Listen, viewer, I know Maxine's family. I kept saying at the time to her, I don't know how your mom is doing this. I don't know how she's coping because she was his primary caregiver. Right. Maxine would come to work in the days, but her mom is, and I'm like, and, and as the, the, the Alzheimer progressed and he yeah. lost more and more of himself, and she went home in the evenings and she would hear the stories yeah. about what he went on with that day. Some of it was funny because, uh, I mean, laughter helps to deal with some of the stressful things. But sometimes I can't imagine how you're not going, oh, my God. Uh, when you heard some of the things and your heart would bleed for your mom. Exactly. You know, I'm telling you, you know, after her dad died, I remember Maxine took her mom to a hotel for a getaway yeah. because she felt like her mom had gone through so much taking oh. care of her dad and she wanted yeah. to treat her, you know, yeah. to take her somewhere so she could relax and unwind. And I'm sure that was also your way of saying, mommy, thank you so thank much for taking exactly. such good care of daddy even though you know that it must have been difficult for your mother oh, as well uh, uh, i remember the night before my my father passed and he had gone to the hospital and i was like asking god for more time and i still don't know how god did it but i strongly believe he showed me a photograph of my mother and he said that this is why he has to go She's tired. She can't go anymore. Yeah. And I remember I just lift up my hand and said, okay, go with it. Go with it because I need my mother to relax, to, yeah. to just ease and unwind. And by 6.30 the following morning, he passed. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, about the funny part of it, oh, there were some days, some of the things that he did. I remember... You still saw his caring character. I remember one day he had nothing in his hand and he went to my mother and he said, you want some of this? And she said, <laughs> she said, put it down, man. You probably want an annoyed moment. Put it down because she knows that nothing was in his hand. And daddy went for her vase. And mommy fly up from out and said, give it to me, give it to me. Because she saw that. He was gonna put whatever it was in the vase that she didn't want to bring. And I just laughed, we laughed at that because yeah. I can just in his mind, whatever he had was so precious. Yes. He didn't want anywhere yes. Yes. that somebody else might come and take it. You know, so those are some of the fun things. But as I said, um grieving from I I grieve for my dad before he passed seeing that he lost his memory, seeing that he lost his autonomy. How long was he sick for again? It, it was quite a while, you know, because um, I remember I graduated in 2011 and he was sick before that because I, mm -hmm. there was a, I had school, I was a single mom. So even that also was a process. I had, I had school in the night. My son had GSAT at the time. I had to pick him up from school. I had to take him to get a bus home. I had to head on to school and to come home and so, you know, but God. Yes, carried you through. That yeah. giving process because my father died in 2014. So I watched all of that and I grieved. And so I think we, we, my mother never wanted that sort of life. My mother did not want to experience she knew how hard it was 
to um, for her when she was taking care of my dad. And I know she didn't want that for me. So your and, mother was not ill to the point where, because she wouldn't want to, she would have felt like she was being a burden to you. Exactly. I know that's how she would have felt. And she, she would have want felt. you to go through that. Yes, yes. I remember the morning when she got the stroke and, you know, I was heading out to church and I came in to tell her that I am going out. And then I saw her stiff lying out on the, lying on the bed and her face, she had the stroke, her face was twisted. But I remember her in her muffled words telling me, do not be afraid. Don't mm. be afraid. And that mm. was what calmed me. That's a mother's love, for you know. That, in the middle of her being yes. that sick, she mm. was she still found the strength to be reassuring you. Yes. She said, do not be afraid. Even though I know she didn't have a clue what was happening with her body because she has lost all control, you know. So yeah. Yeah, that's my mommy. That's my mommy, my aunt. Oh my God, my aunt was another. For my aunt also, my aunt suffered. My aunt had a lot of pain. There, there were days when, um, where she was, they thought, this is it, she's gone. And then two days after, my aunt was back <laughs> up. <laughs> like, oh <my. laughs> Christian, I think if I recall, I spoke to you at one point and you were talking about going to Canada to go visit your aunt because they're saying that she's low and you were thinking about dress and your, your aunt stayed around for months and months and oh, months after. Months. Yes. Exactly. Because that was June. I remember June was her birthday and she just said, Maxi, when you come in? And I said, August. And she said, delay is danger. You should come now. <laughs> so I went in June and my mother stayed, my aunt stayed around until December. Until December. Yes. Until December. But um, as I said, and I want viewers, the viewers to understand that there's no one way to grieve. There is no one way to grieve. It depends on the circumstance. It depends on the situation. You have to understand, you the individual, have to understand what works for you. you know? mm -hmm. I am not a crier, but it doesn't mean that I'm not grieving. Because, yes. there were, you know, even before my mother died, I started grieving. I remember this Sunday, our routine on a Sunday evening um, after church, we would have dinner and we would be watching movie or we'd be watching something. And I remember the, the first week after her being in the hospital, I was sitting in the living room and my brother was passing through and he said, it's not the same without her, is it? And I'm like, not at all, because we were accustomed to her being in our favorite chair, you know? Yeah. What watching movie with all of us so that process for me it it was it was before she actually left us yeah 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 so i'm i know that so it's important for us to understand that grief and that process it looks different for each person and it looks different for each loss that we have and as it even relates to how it looks from person to person who have the loss in common, it's still different because you have siblings. Exactly. Does the grief and how it expresses itself for you look similar to your brother and sister? Definitely, definitely not at all. Definitely. I think my brother still continue to cry. You know, still mourns. Um, I remember one of my sister was saying that, you know, I am now in the room where my parents used to be. And she like, you know, I can't even bring myself to go in the room. So each person has their own different way of grieving and how it has impacted them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of us, all of, it all of people, as I tell you, equally. It's important that we use this as an opportunity to remind persons, you see, that um, <laughs> to be patient and understanding, to give grace to ourselves, as I keep saying, 
but to also mm-hmm. give grace to our family members and other loved ones who are sharing the, the loss as well, who, or who are experiencing the loss as well. Because as you highlighted that, you may not be crying, Maxine, but it mm-hmm. does not mean that you aren't feeling. It doesn't exactly. mean that you aren't grieving. It doesn't mean that you aren't mourning. You understand? And I know that, that sometimes in the families, you might have the person who is, quote unquote, the strong run. Mm-hmm. Right? And you might have <coughs> persons thinking, well, he's not crying or she's not crying and yeah. she's still functioning. So clearly you're okay. Let's not do that. Exactly. Let's not. Let's not do that. Exactly. Right? Being strong, quote unquote, and pushing through and getting things done and going about with the things that you're doing. It does not, sometimes that's what we're using as a coping strategy. <coughs> sometimes exactly. that is what we are using because I highlighted when we started, when we kicked off um, this loss and grief series and I shared about my loss. I explained that for months, I was using being busy as an escape, uh-huh. not even as a coping mechanism because that's not healthy. I was using it as an escape. I was busy uh-huh. doing this, busy doing that, busy because the idea of being able to, to sit still and allow the feelings to flow through me, it was too overwhelming. And while I didn't have any siblings, I'm an only child from my mom, to be judging me or to be impatient with me or to be bewildered that I'm not rending my garment, you know, and falling apart. I'm sure there were people who were looking at me like and wondering, you know, my God, you're so strong. Hello, please. At this point, yes, I look strong. I don't have an option but to be strong in this moment. But I also realize now that it takes even more strength to feel the feeling. To feel the feelings requires so much more strength Mm -hmm. to drop your guard and allow yourself to be vulnerable with yourself because the grief that you're feeling is you are the only one who can feel it and go through it. Even if there are people, which doesn't mean that you don't have support, you know, but that feeling that you have here, you alone, you're the only one that can do that work to get you through it. You're exactly. the only one. But um as, in in go ahead. Um, as you're saying that, I also want to add, um, you know, the one year since my mother passed, we came together as a group and we were talking about, you know, what the day was like and persons were just remembering. And I had to share with them that I mean for me, my my my, my remembrance of her because I was the one who lived with my mother. Um, I was the primary caretaker for my mom. And I was telling them that for me, it wasn't just December 16 that I remembered, like I'd shared earlier. It was a process, it was a gradual countdown for me. So by the 16th of December, I had actually, I had actually, um, it's basically at the, at the end of it, so to speak, you know, I was basically at the end. So it's not that I was waiting on that day to grieve, but mm-hmm. my grieving had started because I was doing a mental countdown. I was going through. And so, yeah, our grieving looks different. It's different. Um, as for, for last month's um, episode, we chatted with Monique. BTS uh-huh. Live um, producer about losing her mom. And one of the key things that she highlights that has been the most significant support help to her is the support from her family, her siblings, and, um, and her key friends. And I know, Maxi, that you are usually that, that's what I'm strong friends. And I know that you've been being strong um, for your family. Every single time you guys have experienced a loss, 
I want to know what kind of role does support play in the experience that you've had in loss and grieving um, for your mom, but also for the other persons that you have lost. Has it played a role for you or have you always just been, you know, the soldier? <laughs> um, the support is there because my, my sisters and my brother. Hold on. Yes, the support is there. I know your family is tight knit and they're close. Can I tell you that my greatest support is just, my greatest support is God. God. Oh. That's my greatest greatest support i have my family i have friends i have all of that but this belief that no one goes before their time it is a major major building block for me that so does are you saying that that helps you to accept the loss easier or sooner for me yes it allows me to accept it easier yeah so we talk about acceptance mm -hmm. and you know about the, um, the stages of grief. We talk about the five key stages that most people know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Did you experience with any of the losses that you've had, uh, did you experience um, any of these five stages besides acceptance or you, you experienced the loss and jumped straight to acceptance every single time oh you yes, say your brother you had a challenge and you had a challenge with Alexandria. but tell me which 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 of these if any stages I did you experience for the most part, i just straight, went straight to acceptance it's so weird don't it no no because you said with I, your father I, you had time mm -hmm. i didn't I, I i wasn't there was none of the cases where i was in denial and and even if there was some level of denial with my brother and my 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 friend, those are two of the earliest, and my grandmother was in 2007. Um, I think I just went straight to acceptance and then mm -hmm. deal with it from there. So you didn't experience anger at any point for any other losses? No, no, no. I didn't experience that. And even that, I, I remember I wondered where all of these, I, I have thought about it, the whole anger portion of it. And I said, you know, probably if these persons had been murdered, well, my friend was murdered. Yes. You know, probably if it was somebody who took their life, like my brother, if it was somebody who, who deliberately hurt him, mm -hmm. I would have been angry. Um, I don't think I was angry where my friend was concerned, even though it was someone who took her life. Um, or probably there was a little, but but I don't know. Probably I've never given much thought to it. You said you struggled with Zandria's death. My question is, what was that emotion that you were feeling? So we got to the point where you recognized that the grief was because of you, you were concerned that she left her daughter. But mm -hmm. what, what label would you have given that early feeling that had you, let's say, struggle with, with, with her? With her death, what was it? It wasn't anger, it was just so it wasn't denial because you accepted was, that she was probably, gone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know, probably there was a little bit of anger. To be honest, now that I look at those, probably there was a little bit of anger, but it wasn't, um, it was more of me trying to understand why. So I don't know if that mm -hmm. is what anger look like, you know, yeah. why would you? Why would you take her knowing that? That sounds like that sounds like anger. So probably, yeah, probably it was that. And that's understandable, point. yes. No, 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 no. And, and that's okay. So now that you have actually break, because sometimes we also, and this is what also is important for the viewers, sometimes we're not quite sure of the labeling. But exactly. now that you have presented this to me now, I can say um, there was probably some level of anger because I was, you know, she just, she had just moved into her home. She mm -hmm. just, home. like, is, so you felt like she just started living and thriving. Yes, yeah, so understanding the life she had, understanding how rough things were for her. When I said she just bought her home, I think she, she, 
She just moved in a week ago. Mm. My goodness. A week ago. And she, oh my God, this girl fought tooth and nail. So probably there was some level of anger, as, as you said. <clears throat> but then I did also accept. So even though I wasn't quite sure why, I still hold the belief that no one goes before their time. Yes. I still hold. So there was probably some mixture inside of that. And then I, 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 I had to <clears throat> process and process and realize that why I couldn't shake it for years was because I'm like, I was grieving for a daughter. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know what? I remember I called her shortly after. We had a long talk because I usually check in on her. But after the lecturer had shared that with us, I actually called her and I realized she was in a good place. Yes. Because she had counseling. She had counseling. And when I realized that she was at a good place, can I tell you it went? So all of that confusion that I had I've not been able to shake my friend's death. Yeah. Once I found out that she was at a good place. Once you found out? That she was at a good place. Then I was able to allow that part of me to rest. So, so sometimes we have to ask ourselves the question, why is it that you can't shake this feeling? Yeah. What about it? Because I remember I used to say, I do accept death. I mm -hmm. do on this thing. <clears throat> and like, I accepted my brother's death. Why can't I accept hers? And when I found the answer, I was able to go into full acceptance mode. So I guess for her, her death. Yes. That and that's one of the things that we, we had mentioned at the start of our talk today, mm -hmm. where we said, where I said that, um, it's important to spend the time to understand <coughs> the feeling that you're having to see if mm -hmm. you understand where it's coming from because it is through that understanding that you will get the answer as to what you need to do that's correct to get through the grief to the other side of mm -hmm. it where it's transformed into that thing that you you take with you because we're always taking it with us, but it's no longer huge and filling up all the spaces where there is no space for or insufficient space for joy and light and love and that sort of thing. Where instead it is still allowing you to, you, you miss the person and you're walking with that, um, but you are still able now to extract the joy. I think Dr. Franklin, who, who was with me for episode one, of the loss and grief series called it referred to when you get to that other side as new joy mm -hmm. because there's so many lessons that we're learning on the way as well yeah. or that's there for us to learn through the grief different yeah. things different days you have an insight about this aspect or that aspect and it allows you to be able to show up more fully for yourself or to show up more fully for other people as well and that is why we can't just be running away from the emotions and the feeling. Running away from it does not allow us to, to heal. Doesn't mm -hmm. allow, and the healing is what we're trying to exactly. get to. That's what we're working on, that healing. Exactly, exactly. We have to face it. Running away does not help anyone because like I started out by saying, it's like having to, to, to graduate from a course that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you can't graduate if you have an F on that paper. <laughs> it just can't happen. So yeah. it means you have to work hard and end up with a C, mm -hmm. but that F will not take you out. Yeah. You know, so you have to find reset it. No, no lecturer is going to say, all right, I understand. You know, no, you are going to have to reset this course. So, and, it's, and, and so that's all the grieving process is we can't move to the next level if we don't allow ourselves. As we get to the, as we start winding down this chat and to move into mm -hmm. our gems next, um, is there anything that you 
and or your family uh, that, that you do now to commemorate the lives of the people that you've lost, the loved ones that you've lost, or any, any of them, or is there anything you know, special um, that you do? Because for some people, there are things that they do that helps them as a part of the healing for them and the coping. We still gather as a family. We don't allow, we don't, we don't miss out on that sort of family gathering that we usually partake in. Um, like I said, on my mother's, on the anniversary of my mother's death, we gather, we were in separate places, but we gathered together on the phone um, we still had our Christmas dinner last year. My, my 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 aunt was a forerunner for my mother. When my aunt died in Canada, she died in December, and my sister and I had to go. One of my sister and I had to go to Canada to take care of the burial. And when we went, before we gave us a listen, we are going to celebrate Christmas. Let us just let December fall off. And let us just go and bury her in January. We went to Canada. You know, in the Canada, in Canada and US and probably other countries, they have what is known as the viewing. So we had the viewing the Friday night. Then on the Saturday, we had the funeral. It was snowing heavily, but we had planned ahead. So you know what? Since we want to gather around after the funeral and talk and mingle. Let us not do the burial. Let us do a private burial mm -hmm. on the morning. So the Saturday we had the funeral service. After the funeral service, they um, they came. They left with the body. The undertakers they they left with the body, and we stayed around. And then we had a private burial on Monday. Lo and behold, my mother's <coughs> funeral is come around in the time of COVID when. It is not recommended that you do all of these things. And so we, we didn't do a viewing, but on the Thursday at our local church, on the Friday at our local church, we had a celebration for those who wouldn't be able to come out on the Saturday. And then on the Monday, we had the private burial. So we were able to still gather you know, um, next week, my nieces and nephews, those who are abroad, will be coming and um, we will be going out. So that is a part of commemorating the lives of these persons. We are going to hang together. You know, we're not letting the memories die. We are, we are continuing the legacy. Years ago, my father was, I remember every Labor Day, my father would um we would go to portland and we would have our beach trip and that sort of thing so we still do these sort of things in honor and in memory of them we still stick together as a family and that's what we just intend to do um the other day we did the headstones for both my parents and so the headstones are now on and the graves are well painted and all of that sort of stuff because funny enough, my father's headstone wasn't on as yet. But just the other day in November, we did them both. So we will continue to just to just continue to keep the family going. Yeah. Pass and on I the think you say pass on the legacy, keep the legacy and keep the family and what it means alive exactly. for the younger generation who are coming up. Exactly. Amazing. I love that. Viewers, this is where we're going to leave this episode of BTS Live, Loss and Grief. Um, I want to thank Maxine so much for sharing with us. Uh, stay with us. Join us next week because we're going to be diving into the gems from Maxine's um, experience as well. What I want you to take with you today is that last bit right now. The other parts are important. We're talking about coping strategies, you know. But that thing about keeping the family alive supporting each other, gathering together and finding different ways of making sure the familial bonds remain intact and tight is a great example that Maxine has shared with us. Maxine, I hope that our conversation has been fulfilling for you. I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to sit and share with us today. 
and BTS Live, Lost and Grief. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. It was an honor.